Dan Williams, Survive Outdoors. Today we're going to talk about wound care remote. Now I've touched on from the previous videos in terms of the repair itself, from duct tape, from staples, steri strips. Today we're going to run down some points after the wound and sometimes after closure, sometimes you're going to leave it open. What are you going to do as well as some other important points that we need to talk about. Wound care in the remote. Here we go. Wound care in the remote. So one of the first things you're gonna do is stop the bleeding. The best way to stop the bleeding is direct pressure. Then after direct pressure, depending on the size of the wound, if they're rather small, we've talked about using Afrin nasal spray or other nasal sprays, but you have to make sure it has oxymetazoline in it and that helps slow the bleeding down. Now, over the last five, six, seven years, you're gonna see on YouTube tons of people promoting the cat tourniquet and all of these different tourniquets. Because of all of the tourniquets being used in the outdoors and even mostly these tourniquets were being studied um, over in the Middle East due to amputations uh, and mines blowing up and a lot of extremities being lost, and the first thing that was being done was a tourniquet. So, needs to say, when the tourniquets are increased, what happens? Research starts. And what they found is, is that using tourniquets on, that are not extensive bleeders and using them too often and leaving them on with some intermittent where you release it, what has happened, they've noticed some dysrhythmias, some heart arrhythmias from the sudden flow of blood when you release that. So, Tourniquets, yes, they can save a life, absolutely. You have an extremity that's amputated, you have a major bleed, they can save life. As far as intermittently releasing that, it's going to depend, depend on a lot of variables. There's no black and white in medicine on many, many, many interventions. How bad is the bleed? Where is the bleed at? How close are you to getting that person or yourself back to medical care? All of those are important variables that have to be considered when you place a tourniquet. 97, 98, maybe 99% of the outdoor injuries with lacerations and bleeding can be stopped without using a tourniquet. So let me just get that out there right there. Closure. <clears throat> so closures, you can close a wound and a lot of wounds, majority of wounds can be left open. So if you're gonna get back to an urgent care facility or an emergency room, many of these can be left open if it's less than 24 hours. Now, they've done a ton of studies on infection rate and how long can you leave this open before you close. The Netherlands did a massive study and they looked and they were saying that you know it was around six hours. And they found out that their study that wasn't true that there was no increase in bacterial infection from the wound post six hours, less than six hours. So right now, what it, how it boils down to this. If you have a wound that's on your trunk or on your extremity, then I, ideally that can go for about 12 hours before it has to be re-excised and closed. On the face, on the head, 24 hours. So, but the main thing is, is that you want to irrigate these wounds and clean them. That's what's important. Um, I want to talk about burns. There's three types of burns. There's thermal burns, there's UV burns, the sunburn, and there's chemical burns. So what are you going to do with burns if in a remote setting? Well, you're going to irrigate the heck out of it, number one. You're not going to have a, some type of agent where, let's say you have an acidic burn from a chemical, and you're going to use an alkaline burn to counteract that. In fact, the research says don't do that. So the best method is one, get the person away from the source. Get them away from the fire, get them out of the sun, get them in the shade, and then um, and get them away from some chemical if you're around that. So you get them away and then you irrigate, irrigate, irrigate the heck out of it as much as you can. So burns and then blisters. What are we going to do with blisters? So this is going to be funny because I'm going to say always, always leave the blister on in the remote area. But there are no alwayses in medicine. So I'm wrong. 
So you're not always going to leave the blister on. The exception to that, if you have blisters on your hands from being burnt, over a joint, on your feet, you're going to debride that blister. You're going to take the top of that blister off. Because you or your partner, you're going to grab something, you're going to walk, you've got to get out of the area, and you're just going to rupture the blister anyway. Anywhere else, it's a fantastic cover, natural cover, so you avoid infection. Hands, feet, joints, how are you going to take it off? You're going to get you some gauze, like this, wet it, and rub that blister off, put an oak stick in the guy's mouth so he doesn't scream, no shot of whiskey please, and then you're going to rub it, and then you're going to get that blister removed, and then you're going to bandage it. Now, with burns, you can use, put a little bacitrace, remember no neosporin, and why is that? In neosporin and in neomycin, the neo, in triple antibiotic ointment and in neosporin, the neomycin, 8 to 10 percent of people are allergic to it. We don't even use it at the clinic. So you're going to use bacitracin and you can use either adaptic, which is nonstick, or you can use telfa. Both of these are nonstick bandages for a burn or a wound that you don't want to, you know, rip that off and they're going to scream bloody murder. So uh, the other thing is with burns is after you leave these on for, and it depends. It depends on how long you're going to get back. Again, there's all these variables that you have to consider. If you're three or four days out, you're going to remove those bandages, let them, uh, let that burn air out for four or five hours rebandage. So that's really important. Puncture wounds and bites. Puncture wounds and bites you are not going to close ever. Okay? So there is, there is an absolute right there. Puncture wounds and bites do not close. Irrigate, irrigate the heck out of them, clean them, but don't um, close them. Irrigation. Couple things I want to mention. One, the plastic bag where we clip off a little bit of the corner, fill it with water, irrigate the wound. The other is <clears throat> the syringe that you can take. What you can do, and usually people don't have a paper cup or plastic cup in the outdoors, but you may have a plastic cup or something from on your Nalgene water bottle, something like that. What you can do is, you take that, put a little hole in it like that, take your syringe out of your kit, you're going to stick it in that hole, just like that, and then you're going to irrigate that wound and help your partner out. What if your partner has hepatitis? What if your partner has some blood-borne pathogen? So this protects your eyes and it protects you from getting the blood on you. It's really, really simple. And you can make this out of aluminum foil. You can make a shield out of a lot of different things. You gotta think outside the box. That's one thing I wanted to mention. Some other key points that are really important that I want you to mention. If you get lacerated and, or you see your friend out in the woods gets lacerated on the hand, uh, wrist, remove all jewelry. Remove the jewelry, remove the bracelets, uh, I have actually seen them a half a dozen times where there literally was an amputation because they left the ring on their hand. Lacerations on eyebrows, legs, hair. With all that hair, it used to be like 20 years ago, we were shaving the area. We'd get a plastic razor, Bic, and we'd shave the area, clean it and irrigate it and sew it up. Well, again, we learn in medicine as time goes on. What we knew then is different than it is now. So shaving hair, shaving eyebrows, shaving the hair on your head, on your leg, when you shave, you're actually shaving bacteria from your skin into the wound. Just take some scissors, trim the area, trim it down short, and that is one of the best ways to avoid an infection. You're four or five days out, that is going to be ideal when you get back into the ED or wherever you're at to get it taken care of. Um, tetanus. When I get, bring up a point about tetanus, 40% currently of men and women 60 years old and older do not have a positive seroconversion on tetanide. That means they are not up to date with their tetanus. 
and there is no treatment for tetani, you die. The organism is Clostridium tetani. It is in the soil, it is found in animal and human feces. So you're out in the woods, you're in the animal's home. And, you know, does the bear in the woods? I think so. And you don't want to get some of the microscopic areas into that wound. So, going out in the woods, make sure that you have your tetanus updated. Other point, and I know I'm going to get some feedback on this, guys, and that's honey. So I'm not talking about... Let me tell you, back in the day, and still to the day, they use some great jelly on a decubiti ulcer on elderly and the nursing homes. I've used it way back when I was doing my rotations in the 80s. And it's shown to work. It actually changes the pH of the wound and the wound can heal better. Right now, though, there's no really good studies for using honey to decrease bacterial infections on a wound in an acute laceration difference. An ulcer that's draining on a elderly person, on their buttocks, or their spine, on their hip for a period of time. Someone just getting cut. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos and they're recommending, hey, carry some honey packets from Kentucky Fried Chicken in your little pack. It's a great antibacterial. Find me a, a study, any study that shows that that is going to be extremely beneficial. Write it down below. All right, that would help. Show me, because I'm not finding any studies. In fact, the latest research shows that there is, it's just anecdotal. Uh, in fact, it could cause more harm and it could actually increase a, a bacterial infection. Uh, bandages. One of the things I wanted to talk about is there's a lot of good research on bandaging in the outdoors that one of the ideal methods to do is you're hiking back is you take your gauze here, you're going to wet that with water and you're going to change that bandage three times a day on their wound until you get back in. You're going to put it on the wound, wrap it with what we, we've talked about it a lot, and this is Medi-Rip. It clings to itself. It's fantastic. And that has shown to be really helpful. There's always a balance on wounds between are they too wet or are they too dry. If you keep a wound covered for 24 hours and you take that band-aid off, you ever see how the skin is really white? That's called maceration, and that's too wet. If you leave it open to air too long and it gets scale and scaly and very dry, then that's not clearly too dry. So the balance is, what I always tell my patients is this, I want you to keep it dry for 24 hours. Don't get it wet. After 24 hours, you can wash it with soap and water. Okay, clearly it depends on what kind of wound it is. But for the most part, wash it with soap and water. Cover it during the day, leave it open to air at night. And that's usually a very nice balance. And remember, no neosporin, no triple antibiotic ointment. So if you're in the outdoors and you're remote, we have a few of these that I just discussed that are different. They're, they are different than if you were at home. So I hope this helps with wound care in the remote and out in the backcountry. Questions, you got some suggestions and advice, write them down below. I'd appreciate it. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. It helps to subscribe, it helps the channel. Hey guys, keep your eyes on the horizon, your face to the wind. Stay safe. Till next time.